So he was telling us about how um, the uh, Savitri, when she was traveling, she would come in the evening to these hermits' places you know, and rest there and she would be at peace but as soon as morning came she would remember she has a quest she has to follow and she would continue on her way. <clears throat> the earth multiplied to her a changing brow and called her with a far and nameless voice. The mountains in their anchorite solitude, the forests with their multitudinous chant, disclosed to her the masked divinity's doors. On dreaming plains, an indolent expanse, the deathbed of a pale enchanted eve under the glamour of a sunken sky. Impassive she lay, as at an age's end, or crossed an eager pack of huddled hills lifting their heads to hunt a lair-like sky or traveled in a strange and empty land where desolate summits camped in a weird heaven mute sentinels beneath a drifting moon or wandered in some lone, tremendous wood, ringing forever with the cricket's cry. Or followed a long, glistening serpent road through fields and pastures, lapped in moveless light. Or reached the wild beauty of a desert space where never plow was driven nor herd had grazed and slumbered upon stripped and thirsty sands amid the savage wild beast night's appeal. Still unaccomplished was the fateful quest Still she found not the one predestined face for which she sought amid the sons of men. A grandiose silence wrapped the regal day. The months had fed the passion of the sun and now his burning breath assailed the soil. The tiger heats prowled through the fainting earth. All was licked up as by a lolling tongue. The spring winds failed. The sky was set like bronze. You'll start, Rosa. The earth multiplied. Multiplied. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, to hear a changing blue and cold hair with a far and <coughs> nameless voice. Mm, there it is. There's the full stop. I think. Yeah? <laughs> no, so that the earth multiplied to her a changing brow and called her with a far and nameless voice. So this, uh, this first line 
suggests the way the landscape is always changing. No? At first she's moving through hills, so there's uh, like the, the brow of the earth, you know, the forehead, and that is always changing as she moves, multiplied, it means becoming many. And at the same time, it's calling her, it's calling her with a voice, a far away voice, and a voice which doesn't have a name. So there's something still calling her forward, her quest is not yet finished. Dana Lakshmi. The mountains in their anchorite solitude, the forests with their multitudinous chant, disclosed to her the mask divinity's days. Mm. So she passes through the mountains in their anchorite solitude. <clears throat> An anchorite is a hermit, uh, somebody who's left the world, gone far away. Hmm? So the mountains are like that, they're far away from human life. They're anchorite solitude, their loneliness. And the forests with their multitudinous chant, as if every one of those trees in the forest has a voice and they are all chanting. So we listen, we hear the whole forest, a kind of murmuring, a kind of song going on. So these two kinds of places with their special atmospheres, the loneliness of the mountains and this solemn chant of the forests, these disclosed to her, revealed <coughs> to her, the, the doors by which one can enter towards divinity, the masked divinity that is veiled from us. But perhaps we can come closer to it, we can enter, begin to enter to it through this special atmosphere of the loneliness of the, the mountains and the forests. Um, Patricia, you could read just four lines, please. On dreaming plains and indolent expanse, the deathbed of a pale, enchanted eve under the glamour of the sunken sky. <coughs> In passage, she lay as at an age's end. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So this is. Another picture, the plains, they're in a kind of dream, a kind of trance. They are lazy, an indolent expanse. And this time it is, uh, it is the evening, it's the end of the evening. It's drawing towards twilight. There's been this pale, enchanted evening, but that is dying now. It's dying, and uh, it's dying under the glamour <laughs> of a sunken sky. A glamour is also something magical, you know? And uh, perhaps, the, mm. perhaps there are low clouds after the sun has um, gone below the horizon. If there are low clouds, mm. the sun rays may light up the clouds and in kind of uh, dull red and purple colors, some kind of picture like that. Hmm? So there she, she rests, impassive she lay. The, she had, here we can see that she didn't always have a, a place to stay. She didn't always have a temple or a hermitage or a palace to stay in. Sometimes, obviously, she just had to rest by the roadside. So there, impassive she lay, very, very, um, in a kind of emptiness from emotion. You know, as, if, 
at the end of an age, as if with that day, the whole, uh, the whole of time is ending. There's a kind of very peaceful feeling. And then just two lines, uh, Ganga Lakshmi. Yes, so she came to places where there were small low hills close together, huddled, it means close, pressing close together. And uh, he calls them a pack, as if they're a pack of animals. So this may be the outline of the hills suggests uh, animals, wolves or bears or something. Hmm? And there, there, the heads of those hills are lifted up as if the animals are sniffing or snuffing. No? And the sky, he says, is lair-like. The lair, L-A-I-R, that is the den where the, where the wolves or the jackals live. No? So the sky is like the roof of their den. Mm. Shiv? Mm. All travel in a strange and empty land where desolate summits camp in a pure haven. Mute sentinels beneath a drifting moon. Mm. Another picture. This is a picture by moonlight. Mm. There she is in this strange, empty land. Perhaps no trees, no people. But there again, there are hills, desolate summits, bare, rocky summits. And they are camped there in a weird heaven. The heaven may look weird when there's moonlight if there are clouds drifting, some of them reflecting the moonlight, some of them dark. That gives a very strange, eerie kind of magical uh, atmosphere. <clears throat> so these, um, these uh, summits of these hills are silent sentinels, watchmen, on guard beneath this drifting moon. And this also seems to suggest that there are clouds. We only notice the moon as if it is drifting, when actually it's the clouds that are drifting. It makes this, the moon look as if it's moving. Joel. Our wonder in some lone tremendous wood, ringing forever with the crickets crying. Mm, you know crickets, these cicadas? They, they make this noise, sometimes it's a very, very loud noise, and there are many of them, they're filling the whole wood, and they go on and on with this shrill noise, no? So there, there she's passing through that lonely, tremendous wood that's ringing as if forever with that cry of the cricket. And that cry of the cricket is somehow a, a sound that wakes you up. No, it's, uh, you, you can't feel sleepy when you hear that sound. Um, Basuji, would you like to read the next two lines? Hmm? Yes. Yes. Or follow a long whistling southern road through fields and pastures that be moonless light. Mm. So, well, let's pause there. It's just one picture. There she is. She's following this road, which is curved like a serpent. No? <coughs> long, glistening, it's shining in the light. No? And uh, the, the road passes between fields, cultivated fields, and pastures where there's just grass. And the whole scene is in moveless light. The light is not moving at all. So it's the, the middle of the day in 
the Indian summer. There's no movement, there's no clouds. Hare Gumsun. the wide the beauty of the desert space where never cloth was driven, no cloth had grace, and slumbered upon striped stripped, stripped, and the thirsty sands. Amid the savage wild beast nice of him. Mm, so also this is a night picture, no? She reached a real space of desert. There are deserts no, in northern India, which has its own kind of wild beauty. And there, it's a desert. There's never been a plow. No, it's not a plowed field, and it's not a, a pasture. No herd of cows, even of goats or sheep, had ever grazed there. So there, she's, she has to spend the night there. She has to slumber, she has to sleep on the sand, on these stripped and thirsty sands. The sand will absorb any water that's, uh, that falls on it, no? in the midst of the savage, wild beast night's appeal. There's something very um, wi wild about such a place. I'm remembering a famous picture of um, somebody sleeping on the sands like that and a lion coming and sniffing. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> it's also a moonlight picture. Um, Justin. Still unaccomplished was a faithful quest. Still she found not the one predestined face. Which she sought and the sons of men. Mm. Unaccomplished, unfinished. She has not yet accomplished her quest, her mission. No. It's because she has still not found that one predestined face that she's looking for among all the sons of men. Mm. Mahalingam. The grandiose silence after the evening day. The monks fit the pattern of the sun. And now the very breath are saying the silence. Mm, so it's high summer. So everything is silent. The day is full of that splendor of the sun. And uh, the months have passed and uh, increased this intensity and heat of the sun. So now that it's as if the burning breath of a great animal is uh, breathing on the soil of the earth. Mm. Sergei? Mm. The tiger is brown through the fate of earth, almost lift up as by a lonely dark. The spring is the sky was set like mm. So that, that heat is like a big savage animal, a tiger, prowling through the prowling, you know, that's the way the tiger walks through the fainting earth. The earth is exhausted and <laughs> but with all this heat, everything gets licked up as if by the lolling tongue of the tiger of the heat. You know? And those nice cool winds of the springtime, they are, they are not there anymore, no little breeze. And the whole sky is as if solid. It's not blue anymore. You know, when you have the really high uh, summer sky, it's so dazzling, there's no color really. And it seems to be hard, like bronze, like uh, you know, the bronze of a statue. So we have plenty of time. We can uh, read Canto 1 of Book 5, the Book of Love. The Book of Love has only three cantos. 
and the first one is very short. Canto 1 is called the destined meeting place. It's a description of the place where she's going to meet Satyavan. But now the destined spot and hour were close. Unknowing, she had neared her nameless goal. For though a dress of blind and devious chance is laid upon the work of all wise fate, our acts interpret an omniscient force that dwells in the compelling stuff of things, and nothing happens in the cosmic play but at its time and in its foreseen place. To a space she came of soft and delicate air that seemed a sanctuary <clears throat> of youth and joy, a highland world of free and green delight, where spring and summer lay together and strove in indolent and amicable debate, in armed, disputing with laughter who should rule. There, <clears throat> expectation beat wide, sudden wings, as if a soul had looked out from Earth's face. <clears throat> and all that was in her felt a coming change. And forgetting obvious joys and common dreams, obedient to time's call, to the spirit's fate, was lifted to a beauty calm and pure that lived under the eyes of eternity. <clears throat> a crowd of mountainous heads assailed the sky, pushing towards rival shoulders Nearer heaven, the armored leaders of an iron line. Earth prostrate lay beneath their feet of stone. Below them crouched a dream of emerald woods and gleaming borders, solitary as sleep. Pale waters ran like glimmering threads of pearl. A sigh was straying among happy leaves, cool perfumed with slow, pleasure-burdened feet, faint stumbling breezes faltered among flowers. The white crane stood, a vivid, motionless streak. Peacock and parrot, jeweled soil and tree. <clears throat> the dove's soft moan enriched the enamored air, and fire-winged wild drakes swam in silvery pools. Earth couched alone with her great lover, heaven, uncovered to her consort's azure eye. In a luxurious ecstasy of joy, she squandered 
the love music of her notes, wasting the passionate pattern of her blooms and festival riot of her scenes <coughs> and hues. A cry and leap and hurry was around. The stealthy footfalls of her chasing things, the shaggy emerald of her centaur mane, the gold and sapphire of her warmth and blaze. Would you read from the beginning, please? <coughs> but now the destiny is what and our were close. Unknown, she had mirrored the nameless girl. Mm. So the destined spot, this is the destined meeting place, the place that's been fixed by fate. And the hour, the time even. These are close, the place and the time. She doesn't know it yet, but unknowing, she has come near to the goal of her quest, her nameless goal. Suresh? But though the dress of man and Gilead's chain is laid upon the work of our wise act, our act inter inter and omniscient force that dwells in the compelling 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 stuff. <coughs> of things when nothing happens in the cosmic play but at its time and in its foreseen place. Mm. So this here he's explaining what he means by destiny, by fate. <coughs> to us everything seems a play of chance, no? unexpected things are always happening. Yeah? So he says it's as if a dress, a clothing of blind chance, something that doesn't know why it happens and we don't know why it happens and it's devious, it's, uh, it's not clear and straightforward, things come unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a dress which is laid, laid upon the work of all wise fate. In fact, there's a fate, there's a destiny which is driven by all wisdom. You know? And the work of that fate, it gets covered up by this uh, dress of chance. But he says, though that's how it is, though it's covered up by this dress, in fact it's true that all that we do, our acts, are interpreting, they're expressing, they're giving expression to the action of an omniscient force, a force that is all-knowing. It knows what it is doing. That omniscient force lives in matter, in the compelling stuff of things. The, the very substance of things which determines what we do and how we think and act. Our acts interpret an omniscient force that dwells in the compelling stuff of things that makes it that things have to happen in a certain way. And nothing happens, nothing in the whole universal play happens except at its time and in its place. And that place has been foreseen and planned 
and determined, predestined. <clears throat> to a space she came of soft and delicate air that seemed a sanctuary of youth and joy, a highland world of free and green delight, where spring and summer lay together and strove in indolent and amicable debate, in armed, disputing with laughter who should rule. So she's come up into the, the hills, into a highland world, away from those hot midsummer plains. She's come up, uh, play, there the air feels soft and delicate. If you go uh, up into the hills in the summer, you notice that change in the air as you go higher. Cooler, <coughs> delicate, lovely air. <coughs> And that space that she comes to seems to be a sanctuary, a safe, sacred place for youth and joy. It's a highland world of free and green delight. There everything hasn't been licked up by those tiger heats. No? There, here that's fresh and green and it's as if Spring and summer, these two seasons, and he makes them seem, he personifies them as if they are two beings, no? Are uh, lying together, wrestling, like friends, wrestling, no? in arms. They're holding each other with their arms. They're lying together and they are struggling. But it's a not a very serious um, wrestling. It's indolent. They're, they're a bit lazy. And it's amicable. It's a friendly debate. They are disputing. And while they're disputing, they're laughing about their dispute. Which of them is stronger? Which of them is going to rule? Is it going to be spring or is it going to be summer? No? So it's this uh, very pleasant in-between season. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Their expectation beat white, sudden wings, as if a soul and looked out from earth's face, and all that was in her. Uh, left, uh, felt, uh, felt, felt, <laughs> a coming change and forgetting obvious joys and common dreams, obeying the end to times called <coughs> the spirit fate was lifted to a be beauty calm and pure that lived under the eyes of eternity. Mm. So this is about, suddenly there's a change of feeling, a sense of suspense, something wonderful is going to happen. Expectation, it's like the sound of a bird's wings. No? And he says, it's as if a soul had looked out from the face of the earth, and all that was in her, this her must be the earth, everything in the earth feels that there's going to be a change. So the earth forgets all these obvious joys and common dreams that she normally is concerned with. She responds to the call of this special time and to this moment of the spirit's fate and earth gets lifted up 
<coughs> to a, a new kind of beauty, a calm and pure beauty living under the eyes of eternity. Hmm? So, of course, the earth, in a way, does lie under the eyes of eternity. It's lifted up to an awareness of that eternity. Dana Lakshmi. The power of mountainous heads assigned to the sky, pushing towards rival shoulders near at the rim. The armored leaders of an iron line, your prostrate lay beneath their feet of stone. Yes, so we, now we are coming up into the Himalayas. No? And uh, the, she's in these foothills, not very, very high up. But she can see hmm, the, a crowd of mountainous heads <coughs> pushing up into the sky. A sailing means attacking. And uh, behind them, they're pushing up. There are other ones, rival shoulders, <laughs> pushing. Um, they, they are even nearer to heaven. So there's range after range. There are certain places in the Himalayas where we can see these wonderful views. I remember seeing it once in Dalhousie, which is also kind of halfway up and very nice green place where spring and summer strive together. And there you see the whole range, row upon row upon row of mountains. No? So those rival shoulders, no? are the armored leaders of an iron line. The high Himalayas have no trees. They're, they're dark because uh, it's rock, bare, bare rock. Hmm. So an earth is lying as if under the feet of these stone um, warriors. Below them crouch to dream of emerald woods and dreaming borders solitary asleep. Pale waters ran like glimmering threads of pearl. So beneath, beneath these, uh, these feet of stone of the mountains, <clears throat> there's this dream of emerald woods, beautiful green forests, crouching beneath those high hills, bending down, and gleaming borders, solitary as sleep. It's very suggestive, no? When we sleep, somehow we are alone, <laughs> however many people are around us. These are borders bordering the forests. These borders are rivers, streams, pale waters ran like glimmering threads of pearl. She can see all this. Beautiful. I sigh was strain among happy leaves. Cool perfumed with slow Pleasure-burdened feet, faint stumbling reasons spotted among flowers. Mm. Yeah, the, the, the poetry in this book is special. It's a different quality from almost everywhere else. No? This, uh, this very joyful, rich, intricate uh, imagery of nature. So, uh, Savitri experiences something like a breath, a sigh, straying among the leaves. And the leaves are fresh and bright and green uh, with the sunlight, you no know, happy leaves. So that sigh, straying, this is a little breeze. You know, and these breezes are even perfumed. They have a lovely cool scent. And um, he, sa he imagines again the, 
or describes the, the breezes as having feet. You know, they are running among the leaves, but their feet are slow and loaded with pleasure. They are so happy to be there. So these faint, stumbling breezes, they are uh, every now and then again uh, falling, fading away. They falter among the flowers. Beautiful. Do you like to read? Sure. Yes. One, one sentence, please. The way the train stood, a vivid motionless street, peacock and parrot, jeweled soil and tree. The dove's soft moan enriched the enamored air, and fire winged wild drakes swam in silvery pools. Mm -hmm. So now the creatures, uh, in, we will sometimes see this white crane, a tall bird with a long neck, very beautiful, and it's standing there by the water waiting to catch something. You know? It's a, a streak. It's vivid because it's white against the other colors. It doesn't move at all. If it moves, the fish will see it. And in among the trees, the, the vivid jeweled colors of the peacock and the parrot. The peacock is usually on the ground and the parrots are up in the trees. And we can hear that soft coo, that moan of the dove. It's, uh, he says, enrich the enamored air. It's as if the air is in love. <coughs> Enamored means it's in love. And adding to that sense of being in love, there's that uh, lovely sound of the dove cooing. And then there are these silvery pools. And in the pools, there are wild drakes. The drakes are the male ducks. And some varieties of drakes, they do have very brilliantly colored wings, um, flame colored, and the rest of the body might be uh, the kind of peacock blue and green and white and black. So, Sri Aurobindo... Is it a white peacock? No, no, this is not a... He doesn't say it's a white peacock. He says a white crane. The peacock, I suppose, is an ordinary peacock. But he's speaking about these fire-winged wild drakes. They are swimming on the pools in these brilliant colors. I think once in an exhibition we had a photograph of yeah. some, some of these wild drakes. No? Mm. Red wings. With the kind of orange-red wings, yes. Ganga Lakshmi. Mm. With our green clover even, and cover to our consorts as your eyes. Mm. So there, <clears throat> Earth is sleeping, lying alone with her lover, the sky, and she's uncovered, she's revealed to that azure eye, that blue, that great blue <clears throat> eye of her consort, of her partner, her lover. And she's so happy to be like that, Shiv. Hmm? In a luxurious ecstasy of joy, she spined her loud music of her notes, wasting the <coughs> passionate patter of her blooms and the festival riot of her sense and tears. Hmm. So she, she's just giving everything in this luxurious way in her ecstasy. She's squandering. It's a, it's a word that usually is negative when we say somebody's wasting. No, but here she doesn't want to hold back anything. She's spreading this love music of her notes, all the sounds of the different birds. And she's also wasting, spreading freely everywhere all the, the intense pattern, the colors, 
of her blooms, of her flowers, her blossoms. And the festival riot, when it's a festival, then you will uh, dance about and uh, put on fancy clothes. No? This riot of her scents, her perfumes, and her colors. It's all nature was a beauty's festival. We have it somewhere else in the poem. No? Do you like to read? I cry and weep and hurry with mine. The stealthy footfalls of her chasing things, the shaggy emerald of her centaur mane, the golden sapphire of her warmth and place. Mm, thank you. So we can also hear the sounds, the cries, and the leaps, and the hurry of these chasing things. <laughs> the, the animals who are there and the stealthy footfalls when, when the, the tiger or the lion is uh, stalking its prey. Uh, nowadays we see these films on television, we can see how carefully they put their feet down. Huh? They are stealing in. Stealthy is connected with this word to steal in. You know? If you, you have to be stealthy and silent if you want to steal in unnoticed. And then the shaggy emerald of her centaur mane. I think he's uh, comparing the, um, the trees, the forest, to the centaur. A centaur is a creature in Greek mythology that has the, the body of a man and the, the body of a horse. But the horse, of course, has a mane. You know? And this is an emerald mane, the shaggy green of the edge of the, the forest. You know? And the, all of this is glowing, the, the green of the forest and the gold of the sunlight and the sapphire of the sky, all this warmth and blaze of the earth. <clears throat> so that's where we stopped and I think that's where we'll stop for today. Shall we just go back to the previous page or you want to go back to page 385? You tell me. <laughs> Do you want to go all the way, way back to page 385? Yes, we have time. All right. So page 385, line 292. <clears throat> the earth multiplied to her a changing brow and called her with a far and nameless voice. The mountains in their anchorite solitude, the forests with their multitudinous chant, disclosed to her the masked divinity's doors. On dreaming plains, an indolent expanse, the deathbed of a pale enchanted eve under the glamour of a sunken sky. Impassive she lay as at an age's end, or crossed an eager pack of huddled hills lifting their heads to hunt a lair-like sky or travelled in a strange and empty land, where desolate summits camped in a weird heaven, mute sentinels beneath a drifting moon, or wandered in some lone, tremendous wood, ringing forever with the cricket's cry, 
or followed a long glistening serpent road through fields and pastures lapped in moveless light or reached the wild beauty of a desert space where never plough was driven nor herd had grazed and slumbered upon stripped and thirsty sands amid the savage wild beast night's appeal. Still unaccomplished, was the fateful quest. Still she found not the one predestined face for which she sought amid the sons of men. A grandiose silence wrapped the regal day. The months had fed the passion of the sun, and now his burning breath assailed the soil. The tiger heats prowled through the fainting earth. All was licked up as by a lolling tongue. The spring winds failed. The sky was set like bronze. But now the destined spot and hour were close. Unknowing, she had neared her nameless goal. For though a dress of blind and devious chance is laid upon the work of all wise fate, our acts interpret an omniscient force that dwells in the compelling stuff of things. And nothing happens in the cosmic play but at its time and in its foreseen place. To a space she came of soft and delicate air that seemed a sanctuary of youth and joy a highland world of free and green delight, where spring and summer lay together and strove in indolent and amicable debate, inarmed, disputing with laughter who should rule. There... Expectation beat wide sudden wings, as if a soul had looked out from earth's face, and all that was in her felt a coming change. And forgetting obvious joys and common dreams, obedient to time's call, to the spirit's fate was lifted to a beauty calm and pure that lived under the eyes of eternity. A crowd of mountainous heads assailed the sky pushing towards rival shoulders nearer heaven, the armoured leaders of an iron line. Earth prostrate lay beneath their feet of stone. Below them 
crouched a dream of emerald woods and gleaming borders solitary as sleep. Pale waters ran like glimmering threads of pearl. A sigh was straying among happy leaves. Cool perfumed with slow pleasure burdened feet. Faint, stumbling breezes faltered among flowers. The white crane stood a vivid, motionless streak. Peacock and parrot jeweled soil and tree. The dove's soft moan enriched the enamoured air, and fire-winged wild drakes swam in silvery pools. Earth couched alone with her great lover, heaven, uncovered to her consort's azure eye. In a luxurious ecstasy of joy, she squandered the love music of her notes, wasting the passionate pattern of her blooms and festival riot of her scents and hues. A cry and leap and hurry was around, the stealthy footfalls of her chasing things, the shaggy emerald of her centaur mane, the gold and sapphire of her warmth and blaze.